This is Success Stories. I'm Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Success Stories is a program that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. One such person is Catherine Glenn Foster, my guest on the program today. Catherine, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Catherine, you are President and CEO of First Rights Global. That's what you do now, but how did you get here? Well, I have spent uh, more than 15 years in uh, the pro-life movement in a variety of positions, uh, leadership, legal, uh, litigating, <laughs> you name it. Uh, before that, I was doing global human rights work. So after Dobbs, after the 22 to, uh, <laughs> 2022 case that overturned Roe, it became clear to me that we needed to rethink how we were doing business, um, that we weren't reaching the hearts and minds of the American people. And that was clear from the studies, from the statistics, and from my conversations with people on the road. Um, just ordinary Americans who you run across in the diners of our nation and, um, and just talking with people on the streets. And what I learned was that even though we overturned Roe, which was critical, it was the biggest victory of my lifetime, even though that was needed to remove the, the cap on what states could do, um, it wasn't anywhere close to enough. It was that first baby step towards freedom, towards life. And so when you look at the rising abortion numbers, when you look at the fact that the numbers are rising the most in the states that border the pro-life states, those states that are doing the best work to ban abortion and offer alternatives, it's those surrounding counties in the other states that are seeing the biggest increase in abortion numbers. And people are just all too often scared. They don't know what Dobbs meant. Um, they don't know what to do moving forward because we had three, four generations that grew up hearing that abortion was a woman's right, that women needed abortion to succeed in society, that pernicious lie that was um, presented to the American people, to American women by the Planned Parenthood v. Casey court in 1992. And having been told that, having been told that we're not enough, we can't do it all, that we need legalized abortion in order to succeed in uh, our school, our education, our careers, our families, our futures, and, and life, then it's understandable that women would be scared. And so from that perspective, from my years of work in human rights issues, my 15 years in the pro-life movement, um, I pieced that all together, and in the months following Dobbs, getting all this input and all this information, it just became clear to me that we need to change how we do things in order to reach the middle, um, to reach the people who are mostly with us, more or less, but not all the way. Um, the people who, um, who don't necessarily dig as deep into the issues as we might, um, the young women who are going to be finding themselves in these very situations where we want them to choose life. And so how do we reach them? We reach them in a number of different ways. Among others, we need to get to um, the women before they ever have that unexpected pregnancy. And there are a lot of ways that can look. You know, hopefully they don't have an unexpected pregnancy, but let's say they do. How do we make them feel safe and strong and empowered and hopeful. And part of that is empowering pregnancy centers, um, boosting them, lifting them up, boosting their visibility. Um, part of it is safety net legislation so that when something happens, if a young woman needs to get out of the home she's living in, for example, maybe there's abuse, there's a path for her. So that this, um, we have so many resources in our nations, our states, our communities, but they, often aren't streamlined, aren't communicated well, and it's hard to access. There may be um, really difficult forms. There may be just proof. You may have to go and, and swear to something that would be difficult for you, um, maybe involving your relationship with the father. That's hard. That is very hard to do as a young woman. And so we need to be making it easier for them and letting them know well in advance 
For example, if you get pregnant on campus or in high school, hope you don't, let's talk about preventing it, but let's say you do because it will happen to some people, happen to me. Um, here are the steps that will follow and it'll be okay and it doesn't ruin your life. So we do that, we make sure that there's a plan for these women and then we also go broader broader in terms of scope of issues, broader in terms of scope of geography, and deeper into each of these. So that when, uh, when we're talking to someone who may not agree with us on abortion, that we nonetheless are able to build a bridge and find common ground with them on some issue. And then we can build on that. And that issue may be something a little bit outside the scope of traditional pro-life. Um, it may not be abortion, it may not be IVF, it may not be assisted suicide or euthanasia, but we can find some human rights issue, some broad, broadly writ um, pro-life issue. Uh, maybe it's human trafficking, maybe it's early childhood education. Just one of those support systems where we're saying we are here for the, the women, the partners, the men, for every single human being through the full scope of life. That's what it means to be pro-life, even if so much of our focus needs to be on abortion because who else is more vulnerable in our society? We can still take a stand and raise our voice on a wide variety of issues that we are genuine about, we truly believe in. This is not lip service. This is actual work, but it also helps to build those bridges with the people who need to hear our message the most. In light of the Dobbs decision, is the pro-life strategy, both legally and politically, more decentralized now? In many ways, I would say yes, for the most part. Um, without Roe to fight, that one federal linchpin, um, it has been more decentralized because it takes away that one federal focus. But otherwise, with that, with that core element gone, much of the rest of it remains the same. For 50 years, the battle has been in the states. Ever since Roe, 1973, we've had to fight Roe, but we've also been working at the state level every single year, uh, at the local level, the community level, um, sidewalk counseling, praying, all of the different things that we can do. Um, and, and we saw a real uptick in that after 2010, the, the red wave of the 2010 elections. And at that point, it just became, um, it, it became so much easier to pass protective laws, laws that are going to ensure that if a woman makes that, that tragic choice, um, if she utilizes her, her right under Roe, um, that at least she's, she herself is protected that at least she's not putting herself in a situation that she's not prepared for. Um, because I know exactly how prepared I was at you know, age 19 when I walked through those doors. And the answer was not at all. I had no idea what I was walking into, um, what I was going to face. So um, there's a lot that has been done in the last 14 years, especially on the state level, continuing to fight at the federal level as well. We, spent years trying to get partial birth abortion um, outlawed and finally succeeded. Um, things like that, we're gonna continue to fight at the federal level, but, um, but so much of the progress that we've seen and the overturn of Roe has come from the states. Where does your passion for helping women in trouble come from? Does it come from personal experience? Does it come from faith? That's a good question. Um, so many different places. And I don't know that any one of them would necessarily have led me to this place. Uh, from my perspective, everything that happens in our lives works together to, um, to build who we are today and where we are and what our passions are and what we're doing. So if you take any one of those elements away, I don't know how that would have changed. But for me, faith has been a huge element because I believe that we are the Imago Dei, that we, um, that we have a responsibility as human beings created in the image of God to defend the rights of all other human beings created in the image of God. That uh, my faith tells me don't give up um, on a person. You can give up on a situation, 
but not a person. They're never irredeemable, um, even if they're maybe irredeemable somewhere else. <laughs> um, or, sorry, redeemable. <laughs> that was a mistake. Uh, redeemable somewhere else. Um, so that's a major part of it. Um, there's hope for everyone. Also, personal experience. I have experienced firsthand what abortion does to someone, or can do. Everyone has a different, unique experience. I know mine, and I know what I was told abortion would be, and I know what it turned out to be. Um, and I think there's a lot of that in society on a number of different issues, but, but that's a big one. And so having been not really aware of what abortion was before I found myself pregnant, um, not knowing where to turn, finding only abortion facilities on, you know, on the internet. When I searched, walking through those doors, I thought, okay, well, they'll give me information, options, solutions maybe, and I didn't get any of that. There was no empowerment, there was no strength, there was no agency, it was just an assembly line. Go from here to here to here, don't show you the ultrasound, refuse to, to show you that one picture you might ever see, um, don't give you any out. It's just on to the next, and then in the end, it's, it's over. And it's both extraordinarily fast, but also one of the most painful, soul-wrenching things you can possibly imagine. Um, at least in my case, suddenly realizing in the middle of all that process, that time in the, in the clinic, that I didn't want to be there and that what I was doing was wrong. And so knowing, knowing that, it was, um, it was absolutely horrible. I don't want any woman to, to go through that. I want women to be empowered, to know that there are choices, um, positive choices that may be tough. Every choice is tough but that there's a way forward that can be um, God-honoring and full of hope in life. So that's another part of it. And then just this, I guess, natural law, innate human belief that we are all worthy. We are all human beings. And, and it goes it's both parallel to, in many ways, dependent on, but also a little bit independent of faith. Because I think you can come to that and it can lead you to faith. Um, recognizing that all human beings have a right to life, um, have human dignity, and are just precious and deserve to be cherished and adored. That is one of my absolute core values. And so that's part of what takes it broader than abortion to me. I have a real passion for the vulnerable. So that certainly includes women. It includes children in the womb. It includes all children. Um, but it includes anyone who's been marginalized or feels like they don't have a voice, like they've been beaten down or suppressed. And my heart just breaks for them. And there's nothing I want more than to be able to lift them up and give them a hug and say, there's hope out there. Let's get you to it. Well, thank you for sharing your personal story. It was uh, powerful and moving. Um, you were a president and CEO of, uh, uh, of Americans United for Life for about six, maybe seven years. During that time, the organization tripled in size, saw its 50th anniversary, saw the overturning of Roe v. Wade. To what do you attribute the success of that organization under your tenure? Leading an organization, stepping into, um, into the shoes of so many greats, it's, um, it, it's powerful. It's, it's a humbling experience. 50 years, we, I, was, I was determined to get us there. We were not shutting the doors until we hit 50. I can tell you that. Um, when it came to Dobbs <clears throat> and overturning Roe, that for me was uh, one of my former colleagues from a previous organization, <laughs> Alliance Defending Freedom, um, 
called it the um, uh, essentially the the one the one target the the white rhino elephant something like that the the to use the safari analogy like the one thing that you just really want uh, crave to achieve in your lifetime I am just I feel so blessed to have even been alive for that because so many pro-life advocates didn't make it that far. So many good faithful people fought for decades, um, hoped in 92 in Planned Parenthood v. Casey that that was the end and were disappointed. Hoped throughout the years with all these cases, um, fought on the sidewalks and in the courtrooms and in the court of public opinion at the state houses. and. And just time and again, we're disappointed. And so to be able to be alive for that and to be a part of that is, um, is truly humbling. Otherwise, from my perspective, it was about, um, about faithfulness to the mission. You know, everything that we did there was with this single-minded focus on, uh, on preserving life on making life better so that every human being would be um, protected in life and in law. And so um, while the focus was um, uh, more narrowly on abortion, assisted suicide, things like that, that was, um, that was a, real, uh, a real target point for us. So I think, I think people just recognized that and said, we can get behind that. We also want to make sure that human beings get every chance at life. And that's what, um, that's what I've always stood for. And that's what so many organizations in America are continuing to stand for day in and day out. You grew up in Georgia, as did I, by the way. Which part yes. of Georgia? Um, born in Tucker, Georgia, right outside Atlanta. Yeah, mostly in and around Atlanta. I went to college, undergrad at Berry College in Rome. But yeah. Well, one interesting fact, Berry College is a beautiful campus, by the way, yes. beautiful campus. Yeah. I ran cross country there as, yeah. a, as a high schooler and mm -hmm. uh, endless fields and mm -hmm. uh, beautiful foliage and beautiful buildings. Biggest campus in the world, most dear per student and the location for several um, film. Films. Yeah, film shootings, yeah. Well, so. one interesting piece of your bio to me is that you studied French. Yes. Not just at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level. Where did that come from? Where did you decide to study French, to pursue it, not just at the undergraduate, but also the graduate level? Yeah, I started in eighth grade and just, I, I've always had a passion for, um, for people. And part of that for me is a passion for culture. It's, um, I, there's nothing I think I love more than just being able to immerse myself in whatever culture there is out there and, um, and delve into it, to learn it, to connect with the people, hear their stories, their likes, dislikes, interests. Um, and so French was a natural fit for me and I got more and more immersed as the years went on. Um, I ended up going to the graduate level because I knew that I wanted to pursue higher education beyond that and that was a natural stepping stone for most PhDs, et cetera, where you may need an, an extra language. And so that would be just kind of extra demonstration. And I, I love the French philosophers and oh, the yeah. French authors. Yeah. My, um, my thesis was on um, the interwar period in Syria and Lebanon, the French mandate there, and its effects on modern policy. But most of my coursework, because of the way the, the program was structured, was on literature and philosophy. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, so. And then you went to law school at Georgetown. How did yeah. you make that transition? <laughs> it's a very different, uh, different path, but I it understand is. it because yeah. I have a PhD in literature and a law degree myself. So yes. I have these <laughs> dueling identities, and mm -hmm. I, I get it. But I want to hear about your dueling identities or whether they're actually mutually illuminating. They're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, I think they're mutually illuminating. Um, after my, um, my master's program, I moved up to D.C. It was working in international work, um, starting with the U.S. government and a couple of other organizations. And so was dealing with um, peacekeeping issues, peacekeeping conferences in Africa and Europe and, and around the world. And so um, I just started there. And that got me more and more interested in 
um, politics. I was seeing the inner workings of DOD, for example. And as I got used to DC, which being a Georgia girl took me a little bit of time, I'll be honest. Um, now I love it, I wouldn't give it up for anything, but, um, but it, it took me a little bit of time to, to get used to, um, to the ways of, a, of a, a town that is a lot smaller than sometimes it seems. Um, and then that, that journey just took me naturally to law school, um, figuring out the best way to, um, to care for people, the best way to, um, to make an, a difference in the world, to influence policy and law. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, it was a calling from the Lord. So um, I am a person of faith, and, and that's where, where really it came from. Um, I was just following and obeying, <laughs> but, um, but it was also a natural progression for me. Well, I associate you with uh, the pro-life movement, understandably, but you also have a, a wide range of legal experience with a lot of different areas. Uh, you've mentioned humans, human rights law, but also uh, health care and Medicaid fraud, First Amendment. Uh, you've done lots of FOIAs, Freedom of Information Act, and, and other sorts of uh, open records requests. You've dealt with health and safety rights and regulations. Um, all sorts of torts and even white collar crime. So you've got a wide range of legal experience. Yeah, um, one of the things, in fact, I just shared earlier today with, um, with some interns that I met. <clears throat> one of the things about, for example, pro-life law or any other advocacy-based law is that it touches on so many different areas of the law. So while I have in um, the majority of my legal career been focused on life issues writ large, it's allowed me to have experience um, and to really delve into so many different areas. Um, and that's also, I think, one of the things that's most encouraging for people who come and ask me, how do I get involved? Even if they are you know, tax lawyers, real estate, no matter what, what their specialty may be, there's, um, there's an application to pro-life law or religious liberty law or whatever it may be that they also have a passion for. Um, so I've, I've again been blessed to be able to, um, to participate in so many different cases, to litigate on so many different fronts and um, it's, um, it's a wild ride but, yeah. but I love it. Yeah. And I'm sure it's been very fulfilling for you yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, this, is, uh, this, this next question has a dual purpose. I'm actually going to plug the James Wilson Institute okay. because I'm friends with Hadley Arcus <laughs> and Michael Maybach and Garrett yeah. Schnedeker. They're ba great, great yes. people. And uh, I noticed that uh, you are a fellow with the James Wilson Institute on Natural Rights and the American Founding mm -hmm. and thought I might ask you about the James Wilson Institute. I've done uh, a legal seminar with them uh, back in maybe 2006. Okay. Uh, with several judges, state and federal, mm -hmm. and uh, we had Hadley come down and do a judicial seminar for state judges here in Alabama Great. in 2018, 19, some mm -hmm. sometime before the pandemic. I can't mm -hmm. remember the exact year. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the James Wilson Institute. I've never had anyone on the show to talk to to, to talk about the James Wilson Institute. Absolutely delighted to. So I was a 2016 fellow, one of the early years of fellows, and. Uh, basically, Hadley and, and Garrett and the team put together an incredible program taking a, a group, a cohort of lawyers, and giving them all the fundamentals of, uh, of natural law that you could hope for in the course of a week. And it touches on life issues, it touches on so many different, um, different aspects of the human experience but they, they do such a wonderful job of centering it in what we all know, or as, as they say, what you can't not know, because it's just implanted in our hearts, in our souls. Um, it is um, a really wonderful, fulfilling experience. Uh, I made so many incredible contacts and friends from my time there and and they do a great job of keeping you involved and keeping up with it and so I've gotten to speak on their behalf um, at different different events and things um, continuing to go to, to different um, seminars and could not recommend the James Wilson Institute more strongly that's yeah. excellent yeah. Hadley is tremendous Hadley is one of a kind he really is treasure. a national treasure yes, that's exactly he really what I was is. Say. he is a national treasure yeah. and if you haven't gone to jazz with him go to jazz with him <laughs> <laughs>
Um, well, you spent seven years with Alliance Defending Freedom. Mm -hmm. I think we established that earlier. Uh, that's an organization with which I work uh, somewhat frequently as well. What did you do uh, there? Um, maybe predictably, I was on the Lake team. Yeah. <laughs> so um, during my time there, I was litigating primarily abortion issues. But then uh, a couple of years in, I would say, I also began to lead the, the end of life area uh, initiatives. So I was dealing with everything involving assisted suicide, euthanasia, denial of medical care, everything along those lines. Um, and at first, I'll just be honest, I, I was, I thought, I'm here for abortion. I have a personal experience with abortion. That's my passion. Um, this is out, it's important, it's great, but it's not what I'm called to do. And then I ended up having a personal experience with that as well. Um, with the death of one of my grandmothers and just just seeing everything that I had lectured on come to life um, <clears throat> the seminars and the continuing legal educations that I had hosted some of them one hour some of them a week long and um, and just just knowing that I had trained up so many people on how to handle these issues and then I'm confronting it myself and dealing with not only the family versus facility issue, but also family versus family, which is hard in a totally different way. Um, being able to have that personal experience as well, it really brought it home. And so that, um, that became a real passion issue for, for me as well. Um, well, I, yeah. I really wish we could continue this conversation for a, a, a whole hour <laughs> because I've really enjoyed it. But unfortunately, our time is up, Catherine. I've really enjoyed getting to know you. I'm so glad that you came down here to Alabama. Thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank you. This has been Success Stories. Until next time.